Now for the good part, adding transaction support. If you haven't seen the beginning of this series, you should check out earlier videos first. I have two ideas for how to model transactions in this budget tracking app. Let's walk through the considerations for each and make a decision. So one idea is to store an amount value where negative represents when something is spent and positive represents when we're funding this. The other idea is to store a positive amount value at all times along with a type enum value. The biggest advantage of the first model is that it's simple to calculate a balance. Just add the items together, positive and negative. But if we wanted to break out the total funding and the total amount spent, the query would involve filtering by the positive and negative of the amount. It might end up being more than one query. It's doable, but it's messy. With a type field, we can just do some simple grouping. The type value also provides more extensibility. If we come up with a new type of transaction in the future, we're not locked into only having two buckets of transactions, negative and positive. It's important to consider future optionality when designing real-world systems. So, based on this, I'm choosing to use the type enum. So let's get started. I'm going to run the Phoenix Gen Schema task. From an automation perspective, it's one step above generating a migration, but gives us control over the context module and the view code. I'll run this, and it's a little verbose. We are creating a budget transaction schema in the tracking context with this database table, and then a few fields defined in this way. There's our type enum, funding and spending, and the amount is a decimal. We'll talk about decimals in a second. And as a result, this generated two files. So the first one is this schema module, and it contains basically what you'd expect. In our budget transaction schema, the budget ID value is just listed as a binary ID, but what we can do is say that instead, this transaction belongs to a budget, which is an instance of the budget schema. Then we can get rid of this budget ID field from the representation. And we wanna make sure that the budget ID can be cast and can be required. And since the sign of the transaction is being represented by the transaction type field, let's make sure that the amount value is greater than or equal to zero using the validate number function from Ecto. Now let's go over to the migration. By default, when there's a foreign key reference, the Phoenix generator will use an on delete value of nothing, playing it safe. This means that when the budget is deleted, all of the transactions stay in the database. But in this case, I don't want to keep them around, so I'm going to change this to delete all. And for amount, I used a specific data type, decimal. Whenever a number has a decimal point, most programmers will default to a float or a double data type. Computers are optimized for storage of and operations on these numbers, but they come at a cost, precision. And that's really unfortunate for our use case, because when you're representing financial data, it's important to not accidentally create or delete money through bad math. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Whether we're using a decimal type or a floating point type, 0.1 plus 0.1 will always equal 0.2. But, and you might have seen this before, if we add 0.1 and 0.2, the answer ends up being different, because there's a loss of precision. This error might feel small at first, but imagine adding a ton of numbers together. At some point, the rounding errors might become significant. Floating point numbers just aren't the best way to represent money. Instead of a clever base 2 encoding used by floats, decimal numbers are typically represented in base 10 with their number value and then an exponent. So if I went to, I don't know, uh, this number, it'll be stored as 24601, an integer, and then a minus 2 representing that the decimal point is 2 over. They use up more space and they're slower to compute, but they're accurate. So let's run mix ecto migrate and start collecting transactions. We can add transaction functions to the tracking context module, and at this point, it should be pretty familiar. There's a create transaction function, which does what you'd expect. And then we've got a few options on our list transactions. I wanna make sure that this interface is always listing transactions that belong to a specific budget. So the first argument is gonna be the budget or budget ID. When it's a budget, we extract that ID and then pass it into the list transactions function. We also set a default criteria of an empty keyword list. Then in the query, we've got a default ordering of sorting ascending by effective date, 
And in the criteria options, we support this budget, which is used in our list transactions, as well as preload, which we used before, and then an order by, allowing us to specify a sorting order. The base query includes an ordering by effective date. So if we try and specify an ordering, it'll end up adding that to the order. But what we would want when we're running a query is to replace the ordering with the one that was specified. So what I do here is use the exclude function. This allows you to clear some property from an Ecto query. So in this case, we are excluding order by and then replacing it with the one that was specified by the caller. So let's set up the create transaction dialog. We'll go into live. I'll paste in an implementation and let's walk through it. This is going to look almost identical to the budget dialog, but I've added a little helper that you'll find in many projects. Instead of the verbose and repeated to form and assign, this assign form helper takes in a socket and does the work for us consistently. Compare this to the create budget dialog where we have to do this to form every time we get a new change set. Now we're going to need a view. So let's create this create transaction dialog HTML dot heeks. And it's going to be a form just like all the others. Now in our router, we can add a new budget action. And this is slash budgets, budget ID, new transaction. It's going to go to budget show live with a live action of new transaction. Then in budget show live, let's conditionally add the modal. And let's add a button that will let us create a new transaction. Behind the scenes, this is just going to navigate to that new transaction path. If everything went correctly, we can go into Budgie and there's that new transaction button. If I click it and start filling it out, then it will crash. So let's go into the server and take a look. The validate event was sent with transaction data under budget transaction. But my handler was expecting it to be under transaction. So where did this name budget transaction come from? I mean, I didn't specify it in my form. I just said, here's a form, here's the inputs. The answer to this is actually a great introduction to the magic of Elixir protocols, which allow the to form helper to convert a change set or anything that implements a protocol called form data into a form. So let's walk through how that works. Let's say that we have a schema called some schema. Every Ecto schema behind the scenes is defined as an Elixir struct and structs are represented as maps with an under struct field that references the module atom. And then it also has the values underneath it. So if we pass that schema into a change set, it ends up being the data property. And when we call to form from Phoenix component, it looks for an implementation of the Phoenix HTML form data protocol. Protocols in Elixir allow dynamic dispatch based on the type of their first parameter. So when we call to form, it calls to form on the protocol, which then gets dispatched to, because we were passed in a change set, gets passed to this implementation from the Phoenix Ecto library. Then this implementation through a little bit of code reads the data property, extracts from the struct the name of the module, and then splits it with an underscore. But all that you need to know is that through a bunch of magic hoops, the schema's name ends up getting split with an underscore by default. But this can be overridden because it's just a default. So in my to form, I'm just going to say name this as transaction. And since assign form is used every time that we run that assign and call that to form function, whether it's a failed save or a failed validation or just the first time that we load the page, that renaming should consistently apply and show up in our form. So with all of this in place, I can actually create transactions by filling out the form. Let's test out some validation, giving it a negative number, which fails. And let's add a new transaction. Notice that this has the current date. This comes from a default transaction method where I just set it to the current UTC date. 
And then this is how I get the original transaction for the change set. And if I save this, the transaction was created, but we can't see it yet. So let's add a list to the show page. So when we load the budget in budget show live, let's also load the transactions using that list transactions method and passing in our budget instance, and then assign that as transactions. Then in our render, we can just add a table and this table will include transaction description, effective date and amount. And now I can see that those tickets were recorded. Now I'm gonna pull out the credit card and do a little shopping. I'll be right back. With all of these transactions in place, it's hard to differentiate between spending and funding. There isn't any highlighting and there isn't any proper currency formatting. So let's bootstrap a Phoenix component and do some naive formatting of numbers instead of just dumping the string representation into the HTML. We'll be able to come back later and properly do real formatting with an internationalization library in the future. So below my render function, I'm gonna put in a couple of other functions. And the most important one down here is currency. Now, any function that takes in one argument named assigns and returns a Hex template can be used as a Phoenix component. In this one, we also defined some attributes above it and added some documentation. We are expecting a required amount that is a decimal value. And then we optionally allow there to be a class, a class when the value is positive and a class when the value is negative. And this is how we're setting the positive values to green and the negative values to red. Then down in here, we can use an array of classes and any false or nil value will just not show up. And then they all get concatenated as expected. So this will return a span that if the value is greater than or equal to zero will be positive. And if it's less than zero, we'll have the negative class. And then finally, we're gonna make sure that we show two values past the decimal place using decimal dot round. Finally, if a class was passed in, then we'll just have that class show up right here. The other cool thing is that if I run from an IEX terminal, the command H and then the name of that function, I'll actually get that documentation in line and it'll say what the attributes are and show me that example. And then there's another component that given a transaction, if it is a spending transaction, negates it and then returns the currency functions output. And if it is a funding thing, then it will pass in the value as a positive, which means that if I replace transaction dot amount with a dot transaction amount and pass in the transaction, now, if I go over into the page, I can see positive values in green 400, and then I can see negative values in red with a minus sign in front of them. And uh, behind the scenes, these are being stored as positive numbers. So all of this switching is working. We have our first uh, handwritten Phoenix components. Like I said, we'll make this a lot better later, but this is just how easy it is to create reusable components in Phoenix. Now to tie all of this together, let's display the total amount funded and spent as well as a final balance. I'm going to do this by adding another method to our tracking context module, and it is going to be called summarize budget transactions. Similar to what I did with the lists, if a budget is passed, we'll extract that budget ID and then call another variation with the same arity. Then in our main implementation, we have a query that is based on transaction query. So we get that budget scoping for free. We clear the ordering because it's not relevant since we are grouping by the type and then selecting the type and the sum of the amount. If I remove this, I'll try this out in IEX. First, I'll grab the budget from the tracking context and then I'll run tracking.summarize budget transactions passing in that budget and getting back. The funding total is 400 and the spending total is 304.43. I'll add back the reduce and if I recompile, now we've got a map where the key is either funding or spending and the value is the respective decimal value of that summing. And finally, over in budget show live, where we are listing out the transactions, Let's also say that summary is tracking dot summarize budget transactions, passing in that budget and summary is summary. 
Now that it's assigned, we can update our view code. And I added a whole lot of stuff here, but really this is a lot of formatting, extraction of the value where summary, we're grabbing funding, we're grabbing the spending, we're doing a little bit of subtraction, and then we're using the currency function that we declared below to display the balance. And in this case, we're passing in a specific class, so it'll be nice and big. Whereas on funding and spending, we are muting them by adding a positive class of text gray or a negative class of text gray. So if I choose to spend just a little bit more money, let's just say $10. Now we can see that the balance went down by $10, the spending went up and the value was recorded displaying as a negative because it was spending. We are well on our way to tracking budgets, but there's obviously a lot missing. What about editing or deleting, grouping transactions into monthly periods or a better way of displaying amounts? Next time, we'll tackle some of these challenges through new libraries, new patterns, and new tests. This has been Code and Stuff. Thanks for watching.